Serious. What is the most terrifying thing to happen to you in a well-lit and populated place? Story 1. Was taking my kids for a walk in the park near our apartment once when a guy and a woman came out of the tree line suddenly, and the guy said to give him my wallet and anything else in my pockets. He had some weird screwdriver or knife thing, and I pushed my daughter, my eldest child, behind me. I was going to do the same for my son, but the woman grabbed his other arm for some reason, and my heart felt like it was going to explode for some reason. I suddenly forgot about self-preservation and jumped forwards and broke the woman's nose. I felt a sharp pain under my ribs and looked to see that the man had just shanked me. But at this point, two other guys who had been jogging were running up and shouting. The police that patrolled the park showed up not long after that. I was sitting and trying not to bleed to death. The man had run off and his screwdriver was still in me. The woman was on the ground crying and shouting because I had also knocked the top front of her teeth loose or out. The two joggers were originally asking the woman if I was the assaulter, but the situation cleared up soon. I got taken to the hospital and questioned about the incident. There was a while when it looked like I was going to be charged with battery for the woman, since it turns out she actually had a decently well-off family and was just an addict. They tried to sue me, but it was thrown out and she was sentenced for attempted kidnapping. I had a tube in my chest for two weeks after my surgery to remove the shank, but it all cleared up after that. Just glad my kids are safe. Story 2. It wasn't me, but when I was still a college student, I witnessed firsthand the bystander effect. A friend and I had just ridden our waveboards like nerds from the engineering dorm down into the public square, Red Square at UW. We rode down nonstop from McCarty Hall, and we're sitting on the library steps watching the sunset. Across the way near the smokestacks, we saw a couple yelling at one another really exaggeratedly. The guy then grabbed the girl and started hauling her about. We were amused, as we thought they were just play fighting. There was a large group of students sitting right next to them, watching and doing nothing either. Nothing seemed wrong until he threw her to the ground, and started dragging her towards the stairwell leading to the parking garage. During this time, a group of five girls left the garage and walked past. The girl, still being forcibly dragged, pleaded to them, Please, help me. We could hear her clearly from across the square. The girls looked and did nothing, and kept walking. Nobody on the stairs moved either. They just watched. My friend and I got up and started walking quickly toward them, but they disappeared into the stairwell before we got halfway across. There, we intercepted the girls who had passed them. Did you see that? They were asking amongst themselves, worriedly. I glared at them for not stopping. I sent my friend to Odegaard Library to have the help desk call the campus police. While he did that, I went into the stairwell and headed down the steps, all the while hearing the girl screaming while the guy kept hitting her and shouting at her. I got to the bottom platform, passing two people on their way up. One was joking about how it looked like the guy was going to kill his girlfriend. They were amused and unconcerned and ignored me. The bottom platform has double swinging doors that lead to a smaller room with an elevator, and then more doors leading directly into the garage. The guy and girl were in this room, and I was in the stairwell just outside. I waited there for campus police while the guy kept yelling and the girl kept crying. After about 30 seconds, he hit her again, hefted my waveboard, kicked the door open, and shouted, rather lamely, Stop it, or, or I'll hit you! The girl took this opportunity to break free and run up the stairs. The guy, taller and more muscular than me, whoops, looked surprised as well but didn't move. He saw my club-like board and gave up immediately. He tried to explain that his girlfriend was threatening to have him deported. He was in the US illegally, passed his visa or something, and he was trying to blackmail her or something of the sort. I held him there for a few minutes waiting for campus police, but they still didn't show up. I finally told him to get on the elevator and to stay away from the girl, and that I'd beat the crap out of him if I saw him doing that again. He scrammed, went outside and saw my friend waiting. He said the front desk at the library wasn't willing to call the campus police, and when they finally relented and called, they said they would send a unit out. We waited about an hour and nobody showed up. Story 3 I had a friend with primary progressive multiple sclerosis. He got sick early too, only 35. As it progressed to the point that he started relying on a cane, and some days a walker, to get around, you can imagine how he changed. I say this not as an excuse for what he did, but so you can understand how anger and depression can make a person behave differently than they had before. By this time, he was not the same man I befriended. I still cared for him and wished him well, but we stopped hanging out after that because his attitude was too horrible. One evening, we're sitting around in a bowling alley bar. My friend's girlfriend is setting up a karaoke show, and the sun hasn't even gone down yet. It's 8.30 at night, three guys come in and hassle her about wanting to sing now. She tells them it won't start for an hour. They hassle her some more, then wander off. They bowl, the play starts to gain some customers, and the lights in the bar get turned on to balance out cosmic bowling. Then these three guys wander back in at about 10. They want to sing. They get mad when she doesn't remember the songs they shouted at her earlier while screwing with her microphones. They get mad again when they're told they have to fill out the little slips and wait their turn like everybody else. They get mad a third time when she won't take $5 to let them go next. 
By now, our entire group of friends was there and celebrating a birthday. We're not cool. The guys wander away again, then almost get skipped over before showing up to do their turn half an hour later. As they pick up the mics, they shout, We better get two songs for making us wait too! Into them, causing feedback and a lot of angry people. She tells them, One song. Everybody gets a chance to sing. It devolves into a full-blown argument between them. My friend, who is having a walker day, gets up to go defend his girlfriend. And in the middle of the shouting, the whole room distinctly hears my friend say, And if a bunch of N-words think they can intimidate my girlfriend... He trails off as he realizes that the entire bar, and indeed a big chunk of the bowling alley, have gone silent. These guys aren't about to, and shouldn't, take that sh**, but it didn't have to go down the way it did. All of a sudden, he's trying to back away, with his walker, from these three guys who are all twice his size while he apologizes. They're screaming at him about how he's a crippled cracker, and they're going to make sure he needs a wheelchair if he lives through this, and his girlfriend can use the walker after they break her legs too. Too far. They didn't have to accept the apology, and if one of them had just punched him, I'd have said that's fair and he deserved it. But we couldn't let them do what they were threatening. Next thing I know, two of our friends and I stood up and I shouted, That's enough! The next thing I know, they're in our faces. One of my friends is just trying to negotiate our way out of it, the other is making threats. I'm just standing there trying not to lose my game face because I'm terrified as fuck of this 350 plus pound, 6 foot 6 mountain of a person who's picked me to square up with. I manage to duck under the punch he throws at me and somehow end up behind him. Desperately, I somehow end up with this guy in a full Nelson, except I'm 145 pounds and 5 foot 8. At this point, I'm this guy's new cape. He starts swinging around wildly, screaming, Get him off! Get him off! The entire room has gone from fear and aggression to amusement. I hear people start to laugh. One of his buddies grabs me by the back of the shirt and shoves me away. I stumble, trip over something, and break my nose in the corner of a table. I can't even claim a decent taken punch to the face. The mountain walks over to me. I'm now laying on the ground with blood gushing out of my face. He leans right down over me and shouts, Stay down! And he looks at me for a second, points a finger in my face and says, I get it. Gotta stand up for your boy. What you really gotta do is pick better boys or educate yours. Then the wave finger turns into an extended hand and helps me to my feet. Bartender grabs me a rag and we all get kicked out together. When the cops showed up and found us all, except Loudmouth, sitting outside congenially, they agreed to let us all go our way and drive me to the hospital, if we all agreed to drop the matter. My friend wanted charges pressed against all three and was threatening to sue the bar too. He backed down when I told him I'd break his nose to match mine if he did anything of the sort. It was the scariest moment of my entire life, and the only reason I lived was that the mound showed me mercy. This freak wanted to bankrupt me in lawyer fees after that? That was 11 years ago. I only saw my friend twice after that, once at a bar and once at his funeral. I miss the man he was before multiple sclerosis. I don't miss the angry, depressed man he became. Story 4. Happened yesterday. I wasn't particularly terrified, but a bit uneasy. I go grocery shopping at the same store at the same time, maybe twice a week. There works as a grocery bagger and once before he waited by my car to help me put groceries in my trunk. It threw me off and made me uncomfortable. I get anxious in social situations, but figured he was just being polite and doing his job. I'm a really shy person. My instinct is to be polite no matter how uncomfortable I am. Plus, and I don't mean this in a rude way, from our first encounter, I get the sense that he's not all there in the head. So yesterday, I went straight from the store to my car, opened my trunk, and probably started putting my groceries in. Out of nowhere, this guy appears, and we engage in polite chit-chat. He asks how I'm doing, and I reply, but make the mistake of asking how he is, there he goes off on a rant of how this whole year has been awful. How he dreams of killing this dog. Not sure if it was his dog or another. He lost me in the rant. And also how watching people hang is entertaining. He's getting pretty passionate in this rant and escalating to how it's hypocritical how the justice system treats m and rape and how it's allowed for Americans to do so in other countries when fighting a war. Note, so that it's relevant to the question, that it's broad daylight. There are several people in the parking lot. I'm an idiot, so I'm just standing there politely and unfortunately, he's standing near the driver's side of my car. Eventually, after a nearly 15 minute rant of murder, hang and heads, I wiggle past him and tell him to take it easy. I'll probably just find another supermarket. I think I'm going to call the store directly and report to the manager what he said to me. I'm not sure if this warrants a police report or not. I called the store after work today. I let the store manager know exactly what he said to me that it made me uncomfortable and I don't believe I'll be returning anytime soon, if at all. Without mentioning his name because I didn't know it, the manager seemed aware of who I was talking about. She says he lives with his grandmother due to his disability, did not elaborate, who she knew personally. 
She also stated he did not have a pet dog, after I expressed concern that he could potentially harm an innocent animal, and she would speak to the grandmother about him. The manager also stated there have been no other complaints before about him, and he worked there for a while. To be honest, it seems like she was sort of brushing the whole situation aside, because she asked me if I told him that he was making me uncomfortable. Now this may just be my opinion, but anytime a stranger in close proximity to me talks about justifying murder and rape makes me a wee bit uncomfortable. I don't know, maybe I'm too sensitive. However, she wrapped up the call by saying she was sorry about this experience and the situation would be handled accordingly. Story 5 I used to take those classes at a Catholic church in the evening. I was put ahead into an older kid class. I believe I was 8, and most of them were pre-teens or early teens. This one guy, 14 or 15, kept offering me money for a blow which at the time I had no idea what it was. A bunch of the other girls would always swore me when he was nearby and tell me to ignore him, not take the money, etc. He was known as a troublemaker. I asked my parents what a blow was, and they found out and made a complaint. His family gave a lot of money to that church, so nothing happened to him. Then I got to the church early and was just roaming around. He was there and got physical with me. I didn't really understand at the time, but now I realize he was likely trying to rape me. I called out for others to help, but absolutely no one did. A few adults would stop and watch, but then they'd keep walking. Thankfully, my older sister ran into us and put a stop to everything, so ultimately nothing happened. He got kicked out after that. I understand not getting involved, but no one even called the cops. Story 6 On the third of this month, in a very well-lit hospital room, my hospitalist came to my bedside after nine days in the hospital to tell me a blood smear and flow cytometry pointed to me having a T-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that I needed a bone marrow biopsy to confirm. The oncologist came to visit my room to tell me my spleen was also enlarged and in her best opinion, I had likely a stage 4, if the bone marrow came back as she thought it would, T-cell lymphoma, that I would start chemo the day after the results came back that it would be two rounds of that therapy, and if I did not respond, they would get ready for a bone marrow transplant, asked me if I had siblings. She said the type she thinks I have is very aggressive, as it did not show in my lymph nodes, but was already showing symptoms in my spleen and liver. Apparently, this is very bad. I have three children, 11, 9, and 7. I love them dearly, and could not stop thinking about them. It put so many things into perspective for me. I cried. My family cried. I became extremely negative. On the day of the 9th, the oncologist came into my room. They had some bone marrow results. It all came out quickly. She was now saying the cells looked to be reactive to an atypical infection in the pathologist's sonoclonal cells. She said there was still a PCR pending that would rule out up to 99% that I was safe, but sent me home. I'm now waiting for my appointment. Tuesday for the all clear. I'm very, very fatigued. I contracted C. diff while in due to heavy antibiotic use. I'm very, very, very tired. My anxiety is through the roof every second. I can't stop researching cancer. I'm scared to live. I'm just so scared. For now, I'm in the clear. The test was scrubbed and needed to be redone, which is in the process already, but my oncologist is now very confident that my results align with an atypical viral infection and that I should be totally helpful. Thank you. Story 7 When I was living in Paris, I was attacked in the Bastille metro station during the early evening, while in a group of five to six girls. This guy followed us off the train and onto an escalator and placed himself right behind my friend. She went around me farther up the escalator to get away from him. He tried to follow her. Being fluent in French, I put my arm out to block him and told him to leave her alone. He then grabbed my arm so hard that I later had fingerprint bruises, and then he just stared at me. It was terrifying. I was telling him to get off and leave me alone, all while trying to pry his fingers off me. There was just no emotion or reaction on his face. Luckily then, my friend just above me turns and sees this, and full-on falcon kicks this guy right in the chest. He fell back a bit, but caught himself, then grabbed her by the ponytail and punched her in the face. By this point, we're finally at the top of the escalator. Yes, this all transpired in the duration of an escalator ride, and a group of men chased the guy off. I love you, Paris, but hell did the men there harass the crap out of me. I should also add that while I was thankful that this group of men chased him off, he also then started yelling at us, saying we must have provoked him and that we shouldn't talk to men like him, and next time just to call the police. To which I just yelled, Where the hell are the police now? Needless to say, our going out plans were thwarted and we went home. On the way home that night, I got my ass grabbed twice and one guy flashed me right outside my house. Now that one, he got punched in the face. Story 8 I was standing on a bus during London's morning rush. It was an absolute crush, nowhere to move. I felt a b press into the back of me, so I shouted for the driver to stop the bus. He promptly ignored me. I had absolutely nowhere to go. I was trapped. And then this man reached under my skirt and tried to stick his fingers up my vagina. 
so I kept shouting about what was happening. Nobody on the bus did anything. The driver wouldn't stop, so I struggled with this man who, by that time, was holding me by my crotch and licking me. So at the next stop, Warren Street, the doors open and I ran. This man chased me until he caught me and put me in a bear hug and kept telling me he was going to rape me then and there in broad daylight. I threatened to stab him in the eye with my keys in my hand and pressing into his eye, and he backed off. I kept shouting for people to call the police. I didn't have a mobile at that time, and people just kept walking past. So I ran to work. The police thankfully took me very seriously. They said that the CCTV systems on the bus weren't working at the time, so it would be difficult to identify my assailant. A week later, the same bus was bombed in 7-7. I wasn't on it because I was terrified that some man would do this again. That certainly isn't to say that it would have been on that exact bus at the exact same time it was blowed up. But I also know that the CCTV wasn't working, making it harder for the police to identify the bomber. It was the absolute helplessness I felt, whereby every person around me watched but didn't do anything. Hundreds of people, passers-by, the bus driver, and my fellow passengers on the bus all pretending that it wasn't happening. The terror of what happened in that instant didn't stick around, thankfully. But the mistrust of the bystander effect keeps me on my guard 11 years later. It also means that whenever I see people in trouble, I make a point of helping instead of standing idly by. I will not allow anything like this to happen to anybody else. It has gotten me into sticky situations, but I don't want another person to feel the helplessness that I did. Story 9 It was well lit and populated, as it was my workplace. I was a poorer in a foundry at the time. Due to a mistake in the metal, it had to be put back into the furnace instead of being poured. A job that is done by using a crane to take the ladle, big bucket full of molten metal, back to the furnace. The ladle is then manually rolled over and the metal is poured back into the furnace. I was the lucky guy to roll it in. And whilst rolling it, the crane driver made a mistake and moved the ladle out of position. This resulted in a wave of 1,600 Celsius, or 3,000 Fahrenheit, metal flying toward me like water off a spoon in the sink. Due to the light coming from the molten metal, I couldn't gauge the depth of the wave at the time, but looked down to see nothing but orange light surrounding me from the waist up. This lasted a moment at most, but at that moment, every possible injury that could come from that crossed my mind. No injury came of that. Like a spoon in the sink, the wave was very thin and my gear was good enough, but I was genuinely terrified then. The wave of metal that hit me splashed back off the top rim of the furnace. I was on a stand, and about half of my body was above the rim of the furnace. When rolling the metal in, it comes out of the top of the bucket, and the crane operator managed to clip the furnace ventilation. This turned the ladle and caused it to go everywhere. What hit me was more like a sheet of metal that happened to be molten. Seeing it hit me, I was unable to tell how deep the actual wave was. So from my perspective, I had a sheet of molten metal around my waist that was unknown depth and incredibly hot. As I was the one turning the ladle in, I flicked down the lock on the turning wheel and quickly turned to jump down from the stand. This all happened very quickly. There was a distinct line and some metal splash in the front of my jacket where the wave had come into contact with me. Once I determined I was okay, I put the gear back on and finished the rollover. Story 10 When I was 12 years old, I was beaten up in a crowded bus station at rush hour by a boy several years older than me, for absolutely no reason whatsoever. It was a completely unprovoked attack, and I was trapped against a one-way door. The adults standing around waiting for their buses to go home from work did absolutely nothing to help me, or to stop me from being attacked. 